Well, thank you, Pastor Paul, and welcome. What a beautiful facility. Come on. How many can say God has provided? His name is Jehovah Jireh, which literally means before the need ever existed. Get a hold of this church. Before the need in your life ever existed, God already made the provision. The ram was already caught in the thicket before Abraham even went up. Come on. And so that is something that I've learned, whatever the provision might be in our life that we have need of, God always makes provision ahead of time. Kathy has a new book over here. It's revised called The Cross, Purpose, Passion, and Power. Uh, she's only got a few up here. You can just see her after the service if you can. I believe this book will bless you. Of all the books that we've written between the two of us over here, that one is by, to me, it's had the most impact upon my life, not because it's my wife, but because of the message of the cross. And I believe that in North America, the greatest message in, in the world that we need today is the cross of Jesus. Come on. Amen. Pastor Paul just uh, made reference of that at communion today. As often as we eat this bread, as often as we drink this cup, we do show the Lord's death until he come. Oftentimes we want the resurrection life, but we have to understand it comes through the process of death. And everybody agreed, said amen. Are you all ready for the word of God today? One of the things that Rick Shimatero enjoys about God's word is that there's patterns in the word of God. And there's things that we learn from the word of God, no matter how long you've been. I've been on this pathway now for 48 years. And what I've learned is the more that I've studied the word, the more that I get into the word of God, the less that I recognize how much I really know. And every time I get in there, there's something new. And I, I wrote a book, and it's already sold out. I didn't even have any to bring up here. My newest book called Giving, Forgiving, and Thanksgiving. And it's taken from the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on the loaves and the fishes out there. But as I was reading even my new book and going over it, God showed me something else inside that I didn't put in the book, but I need to put in another book. Are you all ready? Okay, so how many can recognize that there's patterns in the Word of God? The patterns in the Word of God are like this. The faith that was in Lois, the grandmother, it was into the daughter Eunice, and then Paul says that I'm persuaded, Timothy, it's in you. There was a pattern called generational faith. So it started in the grandma, it got into the mama, and it got into the son, and then the spiritual children after that there. So in the Word of God, this is what it says in Matthew, this is what it says in Mark, this is what it says in Luke, and this is what it says in John. It says, and he took the bread. Come on, everybody say the bread. The bread was the five loaves, and he broke it. And the Bible says he gave thanks, okay? He gave thanks first, and then he broke the bread, and then what did he do? He distributed it. There was a principle that was brought out there that the multiplication of the five loaves and two fishes, it didn't happen when he gave thanks. Come on, church. It didn't happen, listen very carefully, when the little boy gave it to him, the five and the two. It didn't happen then. But it says when he broke it, it was multiplied. When he distributed it and broke it, the multiplication took place. I got to put that in my, in my newest book because it's just amazing out there. So what God has showed me is that brokenness is the pathway in to multiplication in our lives. We oftentimes want it, and I've heard this from the uh, South American evangelists from Argentina. I've heard this from the ones in Brazil over and over and over about brokenness and brokenness. And, and I never really understood exactly what it was that they were speaking of. But now that I've seen it now and then experienced it myself, I have a little bit of understanding about what brokenness is all about. Can you say amen? Now, here's what we don't realize. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, if we can. And this is going to be the text that I'm going to use on this here. And if you remember this here story, you need to know the background of this. In Isaiah 58, there was a prayer, a call to the church, a call to Israel to repent, a call for the church to loose the bands of injustice, a call to the church to break and set the captives free. And it was a fast that was acceptable to the Lord. And in my journeys in traveling, especially across Canada this last year, I've never seen so much prayer and fasting going up as we're seeing right now. So how many know when prayer and fasting goes up, oftentimes we don't see the immediate results, but how many know there's something coming down the pipe? 
there's something coming of expectation and fulfillment out there. So then in Isaiah 59, it kind of describes what's going on in the world that we're living in today. I don't know about you, but, but I can't trust the news anymore. I don't believe the news. I don't even want to read the news because Kathy says, Rick, it, it, you get worked up. You get all wound up. Anybody else can relate a little bit? Come on. Okay. And, and so she'll tell me, Rick, it's not about this world. It's about the life to come. Rick, Rick, just cast a hold of your care. And I said, but this is wrong. And this is, I hate injustices and I, and, and, and I fight for people's freedom and I fight for people. And Kathy said, that's not a battle. That's not yours to fight. Come on, church. So it speaks about in Isaiah 59, they hatch three type of uh, three type of creatures. It says this in Isaiah 59. You can read. They hatch night, they hatch vipers, they hatch snakes, and they hatch spiders. I don't know about you. I don't like vipers, and I don't like snakes, and I don't like spiders, okay? And, and so so this is what they literally are giving birth to is vipers, snakes, and and spiders out there. And so then he goes in, 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 in spite of that there, in spite of the darkness, in spite of the corruption, in spite of the things going on. And listen, church, it's not just over here in Canada. It's happening worldwide. I've never seen things like going on today like we're seeing in the whole world. Amen? And then it goes into Isaiah 60, and he says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. Come on, church. And the glory of the Lord is risen. Listen, the prophet spoke about the time frame of history that you and I are living in. How do I know that? Because in the old covenant, the glory didn't ascend up. The glory came down. Come on. In this new covenant, the glory arises. It comes from the inside. The Bible says that you and I are the very treasure chest of God. We have this treasure on the inside, the glory of God. There's a deposit box inside of your heart, and it's the manifestation of the presence of God. What I've recognized is there'll never be a moment in Rick Shematero's life and your life as a believer that the Spirit of God will not be with me. Okay, we carry the presence of God everywhere we go. Now, we need to release the presence of God in our lives, and that's another whole message on the atmosphere. But we see the glory is already in us. Jesus said in John 17, 25, he said, The glory which I have, I've given to them that they might be one. Are you all there? So he says, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And it says, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Then he says, The condition that the earth will be in. For darkness shall cover the earth. And then he says, gross darkness, deep, thick darkness shall cover the people. In other words, there'll be blinders in this here darkness. But he says, but then my glory shall be manifest. My glory shall be seen. It'll be apparent. It'll be evidence upon you and I. Come on, church. So to me, that is awesome. And then he goes in right after. How many know that after chapter 60 comes chapter 61? That's such a deep revelation. And then after 61 comes, guess what? Chapter 62. Deep revelation. Well, when you take from 58 the prayer, 59 the society, 60 the arising now of the army, the church, and then 61 where we're going to go. But 62 goes on, and it speaks of judgment and harvest. 63 says judgment and harvest. Everybody say judgment and harvest. Okay, it's going to go all the way through. You're going to see that. But there's a call to the watchmen, the people of God, to be at peace. And then the judgment and the harvest. And then he goes into 64 and 65. And it speaks about the new heavens and the new earth coming down. Come on, church. That's how far along we are right now. Judgment and harvest is what's going to come. And the Holy Spirit told me about a year ago, he said, Rick, do not focus on the judgments happening around, but focus on the opportunities for harvest to come in. And this message is going to do exactly that today. Are you all there? So here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say to you right now. The brokenness preceded the the multiplication. Every time inside of our life, let's go to Isaiah chapter 61 and see who the good news is written to. How many know there's times that we take scriptures and we take those scriptures out of its context and out of its setting? How many are New Covenant believers? Come on now. Okay. How many know in the New Covenant today we have the mind of Christ? 
Jesus has made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. We're not trying to get it. We already have the wisdom of God. We already have been sanctified. We've already been, come on now, made whole. Uh, this is all part of the new covenant that we all believe, I know, in this here church. But the point is, oftentimes we have something, but because we don't know what it is that we have and we're not operating in it, the Bible says my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. And it speaks of deficient missing pieces of information. So what I want to bring now is Isaiah 61 and see who this is written to over here. Because you take the scripture in Isaiah 55, and we quote it oftentimes in church. For my thoughts, come on, are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. As far as the heavens are higher than theirs, so are my ways different than your way. That was never written to the believers. Study it out yourself. It's written to the backslider. It's written to the one that doesn't know God and the one that was a part away from God. You can read it. Seek the Lord while he may be found. They didn't know the Lord at that time. And so God was giving you there in the new covenant, what I'm saying over here, we already possess the keys of the kingdom. We already possess the nature of God. We possess the character of God. It's been deposited on the inside. Now we need to bring that forth. Are you all there? Okay, so Isaiah chapter 61, if we can turn up the text, he says over here, everybody read, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach what? Good tidings. Good now hang on. Good tidings means good, glad report. Glad of speaking. Glad, if you want to call it, testimony over here. So he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now this is the scripture that the Son of God, when he was here in the Gospel of Luke, he actually was sitting down, and, and, and he took the scroll that was there. He opened up the scroll of Isaiah, because it wasn't chapter 61, chapter 60, chapter 62. They didn't have it. It was all one letter that was written back then. And so he came to this here part of the scroll, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal. Come on now. The brokenhearted, and what else now? Come on, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those that are bound. So, and then he goes on the next verse, if you want to just read that one, to proclaim, come on now, the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. So, this is what we need to understand. He said, This gospel is written first and foremost to the poor. Did you hear what I just said? Now, when we think of the poor today, we're speaking of the less fortunate within our culture and society that they can't make ends meet or that are really struggling. But that's not what the scripture is speaking about over here. If you look at this, and I'm just going to read this to you, the poor speaks of the humble one. Everybody say humble one. It's actually even translated in the Amplified Bible as meek, okay? Uh, it speaks of the one that has been afflicted. Everybody say afflicted. It speaks of the needy one. It speaks about the one that's distressed mentally or in bodily pain, trouble, or greatly as or grievously. So what I want to bring out over here to you first and foremost, the good news is to those right now that are in affliction, to those that are in trouble, to those that are in times of testing, and with inside of all of our lives, there is going to be seasons that we will go in of hardships. There's going to be seasons of difficulty. There's going to be seasons. Has anybody ever felt overwhelmed? Come on, white wave your hand. Has anybody ever felt like you want to just turn it stressed out? Has any Pastor Paul wrote a book on the rest of God. It's a great book. If you haven't got it, you need to get it, order it. Those that are watching online, it's a great book. But, but, but it speaks about those which have entered into faith, have entered into the rest of God. But what I've learned about most believers today, we're not resting. Come on. We're stressed out. We're working. So he's speaking about this to the afflicted one. He's speaking about this to the one that's in trouble. And then, then it's even translated meek, and meekness speaks about humility. So he's writing over here to the one that's in a broken situation in life. It could be a marriage thing. It could be a child that's away from the ways of God. It could be a financial issue that you're going through right now. There's many, many different reasons it could be there, but it speaks about to that person. And then the first one that he goes and shares after the poor after the humble. See, we need to understand this about God. The Bible says, what is it that the Lord requires of us? Come on. The Bible says the Lord requires of us to what? To love mercy. Come on. To do justly and to walk humbly 
before our God. Humbly speaks about, listen, very, we're able to receive the correction of the Lord. We're able to receive the chastening of the Lord and quickly repent of the things that we've done wrong, the things that we've said. That's what a humble spirit is. It didn't say a perfect person because in the room here, I am not perfect. Come on. And nobody in this room is perfect. The only perfect one, listen, is Christ. Come on now. And Christ is on the inside. Thank God for that. He started the good work. He's going to finish that good work. But the point that I want to bring out, we're all broken people at times in our life. We all go through things inside of our life that are difficulty, that are challenging. And when you read the Word of God, there was a man in the Bible that I'd like to go into in a little bit here, and his name was Peter. And how many know Peter denied Christ three times? But how many know that wasn't the only mess up that Peter made? Peter actually, if you look it up, and I don't have time to go through my newest study, 16 different times Peter messed up in Scripture. Okay? He put his foot in his mouth 16 different times. And, and then here's something else. There's 16 exact times of suffering that the apostle Peter mentions in his Bible. Come on in his epistle. And there's also 16 times of glory. So here's the biggest thing is we miss it. We're disappointed even inside of our, we're broken on the inside of ourselves. But he didn't stay in his brokenness. He came into the place of wholeness that even the shadow of Peter would heal the sick. Even the brokenness that he was in himself became a wholeness after the day of Pentecost. And that wasn't it. Listen very carefully. Even after the day of Pentecost in the book of Galatians, he still messed up. So this gives me hope. Come on now. This gives me hope that no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, there's another day in God and God out of this brokenness. Amen? So here's the keys that I want to give you today. In the book of Acts chapter 4, how many know Acts 4 came before Acts chapter 5? Deep revelation. Acts chapter 4 is a party. Why? Because there's a man there. His name is Joseph. You call him Joseph, and his nickname, Barnabas. Barnabas is who you hear named after this here, but his original name was Joseph or Joseph from Cyprus. He was a Cypriot. I was just over there a couple years back, beautiful island over there in Cyprus. But anyway, Joseph comes, and he comes to Pastor Paul one day, and he says, Pastor Paul, I got this piece of property right over here in downtown Toronto. And I just want to grace the church and give you this here piece of property. Come on now. Okay? The thing's worth probably $40 million, okay? And so I just bring it over and I give it to Pastor Paul and Juana. And guess what the church does? Come on. Woohoo! There's a great celebration. Am I not right? Come on, church. Okay, there's a great celebration that goes on. Pastor Paul's got a piece of property, and it, the zoning's already changed. It's already there for the nonprofit so he can build this church. This is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 4. Then we go into Acts chapter 5. Everybody say Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5 is the story of Ananias and Sapphirias. They were there and witnessed the blessing, the breakthrough that actually came to Peter and the disciples. And so they get this idea, hey, we're going to give a piece of property too. But they didn't do it with the right motive. They did it with the, right, the wrong heart. Joseph's or Barnabas had done it with the right heart, but these people didn't do it with the right heart. And we know judgment fell. Come on, church. And then that's the chapter. And then it speaks about the church after that. It grew and it multiplied. Judgment didn't stop it. The church grew and multiplied, Right? And then guess what happened then after that? Comes Acts chapter 6. Wow, that's so deep, Pastor. Okay, so they got thrown in prison, then they got released. The angel of the Lord comes and ministers to them, and they get out, and they go right back into the temple and preach. And then in Acts chapter 6, there's a fighting going on with the Grecian widows and the Hebrew widows. And it's in the church, and hang on, it's when the church was doing well. It's when the church was advancing. It's when the church was growing, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this here strife and this bickering that goes on, not outside the church, but inside the church. 
And guess what happened over there? The disciples stopped everything, and they said, hey, hey, wait a minute. This isn't healthy. This isn't good. I'm paraphrasing this here. We need to get some people here, and we need to set some men over this here to deal with the food bank, to deal with this here crisis. And the Bible said they did. Come on. And as soon as they did, are you ready? As soon as they did, the Bible says that, that there was peace, and it said that the church began to multiply. Are you there? So the pain came first, and then the gain came afterwards. I've recognized, folks, this is not just over here in Acts chapter 6. This is all the way through the Bible. When we speak about the loaves and the fishes, if you take happen with just prior to that was the beheading of John the Baptist. That was a grievous time, and three of the four writers bring it in the Gospel of John. He was already in prison out there. So the breakthrough anointing came, and the breakthrough came to the brokenhearted after there was grief, after there was sorrow, after there was pain. God said, okay, this is a setup now for the greatest miracles. You know, when Pastor Paul had the situation even over here, just recently over there, look what God has done. Come on now. I don't know about you, but I come into this place and I'm just excited. I, I'm just, it's so light out there in the hallways. It's just the children's area is amazing. God has blessed. Yeah. But how many know there was a hit that came first? Hello? And if you understand, this is the pattern that Rick Shimatero is saying. Now listen to this here one in Acts chapter 9. There's a man in the Bible, and his name is Paul, okay? We know him as Saul of Tarsus prior. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 that he came over to Jerusalem and he wanted to join with James and he wanted to, who was the pastor, he wanted to join with Peter and the other disciples. But the Bible said they didn't trust him. Come on. They said he, they were afraid of him. And Barnabas comes up in the midst of that. So can you imagine the tension that was there? Hey, they're in Jerusalem now. They got the apostle Paul with them. He's been preaching. He's been doing incredible things. And Barnabas is with them and has seen him out there. He's the real deal. He doesn't. But the disciples don't trust him. And the disciples don't believe that's the, he's the real deal. So guess what happens over there? Barnabas puts his reputation on the line. Okay, and he says, I believe in him, I affirm him. That's how he got the name, listen, son of encouragement, come on now, is because, because he believed in somebody that nobody else did. And then we saw the church all work together. Come on. They all got together, got them down on the basket on the wall. You've read that story. And then we saw the deliverance came afterwards. But here's the thing. The brokenness came first, and then the deliverance came afterwards. With the apostle Paul, when he got, when he got in with the church at Jerusalem, God had another plan. Come on. And this is what the plan. A great company, hang on. A great company of the priests came to the Lord in Acts chapter 6. Now we're seeing great multitudes now coming in in Acts chapter 9 to the place where after the hit, after the brokenness, guess what happened out there? The Bible says Peter now went down to the same area he had been before, and it was in Lydda and Sauron. If you check that out, it's what we would know as the area uh, uh, towards Lebanon today. And so he went down to those two areas, and when he went down to those areas, God opened up the heavens now because of the brokenness brokenness that was now restored to their lives, and he goes down there, and the Bible says that two entire cities got saved. Every person in the city, when Aeneas, he said, take up your bed, when he got healed, guess what happened? Every person in the city got well. I'm here to tell you today, church, Meadowvale Life, I'm here to say, whatever challenge you're in, whatever stressful situation you're in, whatever broken situation you're in today, don't focus on that. Focus on God's got something ready to break through today. This adversity, it's temporal. This challenge is temporal. This trouble is temporal. This affliction is temporal. But God's word is eternal. Now hang on, hang on. Why, can, why am I saying this so boldly? Why am I saying this so confident? In the Bible, it says in the book of Exodus chapter 1, there was some Hebrew midwives that the boss, Pharaoh, calls them in and says, hey, girls, come on. Come on in. He brings them into his inner quarters, and he says, listen, these Hebrews are multiplying too quickly. 
we got to do something about it. I want you, when they're born, to kill those babies. Get rid of them however you do it. But these boys, if it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, let it live. But if it's a boy, take that bad boy out. Come on. How many, how, is that in the Bible, Pastor? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. The Pharaoh says, okay, I got them now. These midwives are going to take care of it. But the midwives, the Bible says they feared God, and they didn't do as the Pharaoh said. And they allowed them to live. Okay, now hang on. So the scripture says, and the more that Pharaoh afflicted them, the more that they grew. I'm here to tell you, listen, out of the afflicted times, the troubled times, the challenging times inside of life, the more that you're going to grow in your walk with God. Oftentimes we say, God, I want to walk with you closer. I want to walk with you like Pastor Paul. I want to walk with you like the disciples did. And God says, okay, that's a, that's a prayer that God says, I like, come on. And so the opportunities come, then trouble comes. Come then affliction comes. And what do we do? We want to run away from it. And God said, no, the more that they afflicted them, the more that they grew. <laughs> and hang on. The midwives were in a situation where they wanted to obey God, and they did. And then you go down seven verses after the affliction, and the Bible says the Lord gave the midwives houses. Come on now. It didn't say they paid for them. It didn't say they had mortgages for them. The Lord gave the midwives houses. Come on. But the point I'm bringing is the challenge came first and then the breakthrough afterwards. Now listen, we could just keep going. I'll just give you a few more. Is, is anybody learning anything? Okay, here's Paul and here's Silas, and the two of them get thrown into jail. They're preaching Jesus. They're having revival everywhere they're going. They're seeing miracles going on. They wanted to worship him as God. And they said, no, we're not Zeus. We're not anybody like that. So they throw him into jail. And the Bible said before they did, they were beaten severely. Is exactly what it says in Acts 16. So they take this beating and this licking going on. And then guess what happens after the beating and the licking? The Bible said the two of them get together. And at this time, it's midnight. And so they decide to have a prayer meeting in the prison. Well, I, I don't know about you. I usually go to bed by 9 o'clock at night. Okay? So if I'm trying to sleep, and all of a sudden there's two prisoners in here that just got thrown in into the lower part of the dungeon, okay? And they're singing, and they're praising God. Come on. That doesn't make a lot of sense in the natural. They just got beat up. They just got the, the, the tar beat out of whatever, whatever you want to call them. They were beaten severely is what this kid. And so they started praising, and they started thanking God. Come on, in the middle. So would you say they were in trouble? Would you say they were afflicted? Would you say they were in hardship? Would you say they were brokenhearted? Yeah, all those there are the definitions of it. So guess what happens out there? The Bible says that something went and shifted in the atmosphere. And, and guess what happened? They didn't focus on the trouble. They didn't focus on the hardship. They focused on God in the midst of the hardship and trouble. And when they did, the Bible said an earthquake came. And it shook the whole foundations of the penitentiary system. And guess what else happened? All the chains were loosed off of all the, all the prisoners. Now listen, if you don't believe in miracles, if all the chains came off the prisoners that were all in there and not a one of them left, I mean the ones off their legs, the one off their arms, the ones off their hands, they were in stocks, the Bible said, and all the prisoners were set free at the same moment. Are you there? Now how did it all come? The hardship came first. The trouble came first. And then, then guess what the result of that was? The result was all good news. The jailer says, oh, my God, all the chains are off. They're going to escape. They're going to run out of here. And Paul says, hey, 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 wait. don't stress out, dude. We're all here. Yeah. Okay, now that's a miracle. <laughs> okay, so they're all here. So here's what the result was. God wanted to birth the church over in Philippi. But he used some of the most, he used some of the most extraordinary people to birth this here church. What do you mean by that, Pastor Rick? Well, well, hang on. The Bible says the jailer called, and, and he called for light, and so they came, and so it must have been dark down there. And when he came down there, he saw that they were all there. And then he said, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And your household, that's the scripture that we get for our whole household to be saved, right or wrong. 
And so he takes all of his family, his wife and all of his kids and whoever else is in the house, and they all get baptized the same night. Okay, that's what it says. Is that right? Am I, am I correct, Pastor Paul? Okay, so they all get baptized. Hang on. So, so guess what happened? Uh, go fast forward 10 years later, and you'll see a full-blown church that's going on called the church at Philippi. Yeah. The church at Philippi started in the dungeon. The church at Philippi started with broken people. The church at Philippi started with trouble, and it's actually the only epistle that we know today in the Bible that is literally called by scholars around the world the epistle of joy. So the epistle of joy started in the dungeon. It started in the midst of trouble. It started in the midst of difficulties. Now, I've looked at this here, Kathy and I. We went through some challenging times about three years ago. And in the midst of that challenging time, we made some mistakes. Anybody ever say something you wish you didn't say? But how many know after you say it, it's kind of late to take it back? Come on. But you sat there, so we did the best we could. We made amends for that there. But basically, the bottom, our world bottomed out three years ago. And all I can say is all of a sudden, here we are now, and we got nothing. We got, all, all, all we had to live was basically our, our pensions that Kathy and I have. That's all we had. And so it's like all of a sudden here you got a salary, and all of a sudden you don't have that. And so everything in our world fell apart. But guess what happened? That trouble was a springboard for God to get involved. And it brought us into the place. Kathy and I were down in Florida uh, uh, just a year ago, February, and, and we were down there. I, I, my secretary from up in Brampton, where my office is at, she actually calls and says, uh, Pastor, I don't want to bother you on your holidays, but I think you need to know something. I said, what's that? A check just came in for $100,000. Come on, church. Now, that might not sound like something major on that, but to us it was very, very major, but also it was a confirmation that God had our back. But here's the point that I want to bring in. What trouble are you going through? If we understand and really believe the Scriptures, the Bible says many, not a few, but many. What does it mean, many? A good amount of the times that you and I are in, many are the afflictions of the righteous. He didn't say the afflictions, the trouble, the testing of the unrighteous, but he said many are the afflictions of the righteous, but there's a second part to that. But the Lord delivereth them out of them all. So here's the thing, sir. Here's the thing now. Are you focusing today on the affliction? Are you focusing today on the trouble? Are you focusing today on the difficulty? Are you focusing on today on what they did or what should have been done or what could have been done or what uh, would have been done? Are you focusing on that? Are you focusing on there's a second part of this here that God says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Start looking for how the Lord is going to deliver you out of this situation. And it's not going to be by your manipulation. It's not going to be by anything you do, but it's going to be by what he does. Right. Daniel goes in, and he's a trusted man. I don't have it right in front of my mind right now, but he went through many, many kings in, in the nation of Babylon. We also know that he was over there in the Persian Empire. And the Bible says King Darius was in charge over there, the Medes now, and four of the guys were jealous of his anointing. Four of the guys were jealous of his God. Four of the guys were jealous of everything that Daniel stood for, right or wrong. And they pass a law in the uh, Medes Empire that literally sets him up. At the time of the symbol, at the time of the trumpet, everybody's to stop and to bow down and worship. And they knew that this Daniel wasn't going to do that. Come on. So here's Daniel, an older guy. Uh, some of the scholars that I've read say he was probably in his late 80s at this time when they put him in to the lion's den. And so here's the trouble, here's the affliction, here's the test that Daniel is standing right before. Can you all say amen? And then guess what happens out there? He goes into the lion's den, and the, 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 the lions can't touch him. The lions can't harm him. Why? Because he gave thanks and praise to God prior to that, as was his habit. And so the atmosphere was sanctified. Come on, church. And he was protected. But afterwards, the king Darius says, this God of Daniel is the God that's going to be now in this province. 
Listen, the promotion didn't come before. The promotion came after the test. I want to tell you there's somebody here today that God's got a promotion for you. Somebody here, God's got a breakthrough for you. And listen, listen. The Bible says, Paul said, a great open door is before me, and there are many adversaries. Have you ever thought this, that the adversaries are the confirming word that you're in the will of God, not out of the will of God? Have you ever thought that the adversaries that are coming, that are roaring against your mind, it's not going to happen, it's not going to break through, that just the opposite is what God has for your life? Have you ever thought of that? A great open door is set for Meadow Life. Meadow Vale Life. Willowdale Willowdale Life. Where was I last week? Okay. A great open door is for Willowdale. Okay. And, and, and hang on. The adversary is the confirmation that you're in the will of God. Are you all there? So this is what I need to close with. I know my time is limited, but I have, this is my final challenge to everyone today. If the Bible's true, and I know it is, if what I'm sharing is true, then you are destined for great multiplication on the other side. And that multiplication is going to come in family members. That multiplication is going to come in every area of your life. It's going to come in your finances as you're obedient to the word of God. Come on. It's going to come in your marriage. You're going to have the latter years to be more productive and more fruitful than the earlier years. Those kids are coming back. So everybody stand up as we wind down. Everybody just stand up for a minute, okay? And let's just say this today. Out of my brokenness is coming Jesus' wholeness. I recognize today that the enemy is the adversary. So I'm going to be sober. I'm going to be vigilant. For my adversary, the devil, walk us about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. I resist Satan. I resist accusation. I resist condemnation. I resist failure. I resist lack. I resist shortage. I resist sickness. And I resist disease. And I decree that in my DNA which is God's DNA, that multiplied blessings are coming my way. I'll say it again, that multiplied blessings are coming my way. I decree that multiplied breakthroughs are coming my way. I decree that multiplied salvations are coming to my friends, to my family, and to my offspring. Multiplied favor is coming my way. Multiplied healings are flowing through me. And multiplied restoration is coming my way. Multiplied miracles are here today. And multiplied grace is upon me in the storm, in the trouble, in the challenge, in the affliction, to see the salvation of God. Pastor Paul, you're up. Hallelujah. Praise hallelujah.